A little while ago, I made a video about switched reluctance motors, and in that video was a homemade version of this type of motor that I sort of use as a prop. But some of you were quite disappointed after watching that, that they didn't get to see the motor actually running in that video. Now, I apologize for that, I didn't have a controller that was capable of driving that motor uh, at the time. But now, I finally finished making a driver for this motor, uh, and so this time I can spin it up. So here's a little clip of the motor finally running. Good, so now that we got that out of the way, uh, I think this gives us an interesting opportunity to talk about how these electronics actually work, because in that last video uh, I talked a lot about the motor itself and how it works, but I didn't really discuss the kind of electronic circuit that you might use to drive one, so that's what we're going to talk about in today's episode. So let's just start off by quickly reminding ourselves of what this driver needs to do to get that motor to turn. Uh, now if you want to know more details on you know, how this type of motor works, I recommend you watch that previous episode. But in, a very basic, um, in very basic terms, what you've got is a bunch of coils in that motor that are split up or grouped up into a bunch of different pairs. So in my case, my motor has three pairs of coils, which you could t call... Uh, the phases of the motor, so you could call it a three-phase um, SRM. And the, the way that it operates is you turn on these coils in a certain order um, and at precisely timed moments based on the position uh, of that rotor. So the most basic ingredient that you need for an SRM motor controller is an electronic circuit that can switch an electric current through a coil on or off at the right moment, but we'll get to the right moment later on in the video. Let's just focus on doing the switching uh, first of all. So the simplest approach that you might think of uh, is to use a single transistor or maybe a MOSFET or some other semiconductor uh, switching device and just put that in series with one of your phases or one of your pairs of coils. So that way, if you turn the transistor on, the current uh, can flow through the coil, and if you turn it off, then the current stops. The problem is, uh, this circuit is not going to last very long. In fact, it's probably going to destroy itself um, almost immediately. Uh, the reason for this is that the moment that transistor opens, uh, the current stops almost instantaneously, meaning you're going to get a huge voltage spike uh, across your switching device, and that's going to destroy the switching device uh, very, very quickly. This method of switching off an electric current uh, is like trying to stop a truck that is moving at speed by letting it slam into a wall. Uh, yes, it'll stop very quickly, but it also destroys all the parts that are involved in the process. So this is not the way to do it. Uh, the way you might try and fix this is to use what's called a diode. So a diode is an electronic component that uh, allows electric current to pass through it in one direction, uh, but not in the opposite direction. So it's sort of like a check valve, but for electric current. And what you can do with this is you can connect one of those uh, anti-parallel with your phase or with your set of coils. So that way, if your transistor opens, your transistor turns off, the electric current can actually go through that diode, you're back up to the top, and freewheel for a while, you know, run in circles for a bit. That way you avoid this big voltage spike and your switching device uh, survives, which is great. So this circuit works, it works in that the components will all uh, survive, but it's still not a very practical circuit. Um, and the reason it's not a very practical circuit is something that I talked about in my previous video, which I'm just going to play here to, to remind ourselves of what that was. And you're also going to have to turn it off a little bit early uh, to allow for it to fall back down to zero uh, before you reach that point. Because if you, if you leave it on for too long, it takes too long for it to fall back down to zero and you end up slowing the motor down again, which of course you don't want. Exactly. So we want the electric current to fall back down to zero as quickly as possible when we switch off that phase. Problem is with this circuit, after that transistor opens, the current will run in circles for quite some time. It takes quite a while for it to completely die out 
which is not uh, what we want. And now, of course, when I say quite a while, um, like for, for a human observer, it's probably still way too fast uh, to even notice. But, you know, in the world of a fast spinning electric motor, it takes too much time. So you want a circuit that is capable of stopping the current more quickly. Uh, not as quickly as the first circuit with only a transistor, because that's going to destroy things. Uh, but we want something that turns off the current much faster than this. So this is where we get to the circuit that actually works, the circuit that I actually used here and that a lot of um, commercial switch reluctance motor drives also use. Uh, and it looks like this. So it is a circuit that has two switching devices or two transistors uh, and also two diodes. And so if both transistors in this case are turned on, uh, that allows electric current to flow uh, through your phase, through your coil, and for it to be turned on. Uh, and then if you turn both of these transistors off, uh, then the electric current can actually uh, flow through your diodes uh, and back into your power supply. And so the big difference here between you know, this and the circuit with only one transistor and one diode is that now in that freewheeling loop that we've essentially still created, uh, there is now that voltage source sitting in there. So it's no longer just running in a low resistance loop for a while, but there is you know, your power source is part of that loop. And that's why the current will decay uh, much more quickly. So you can turn off the current through that coil much faster. Uh, and an added bonus of this is that the energy that is in the magnetic field is now being recovered. So the, the magnetic field energy is effectively sucked back into the power supply. So it's also more energy efficient because if you just use that uh, single diode method uh, from before, then all of that energy is effectively burned off as heat as the current passes through your coil uh, and your diode. So it's also more energy efficient to do it this way. So this is the circuit that is, that is actually used. Uh, so if we take a look at this uh, driver board, you can see all of these parts. So just keep turning it right now. <laughs> so over here, you can see our switching devices, so our transistors. So these are MOSFETs. MOSFETs are fairly common for you know, low voltage motor drives. They're getting more common for high voltage drives as well. Uh, I digress. So we've got our MOSFETs here. So these are the top MOSFETs in our circuit. Uh, and then here are the low side or the bottom MOSFETs in our circuit. Uh, then all of those diodes I've put here. So this is all of the diodes uh, that we also talked about. So that is our switching circuit uh, that does the actual switching of the current through our coils. So what's interesting as well about this circuit uh, is, as you might have noticed if you're familiar with other types of motor drivers, uh, this is different from the kind of circuit that you see in a normal electronic speed control for a permanent magnet motor. Uh, and also you can see the number of wires that goes to our motor is different because in a normal uh, three-phase BLDC motor, uh, your windings are tied together in a star or triangle configuration. Uh, so you have three wires coming out of your motor, whereas in this case, you know, we have our phases independently connected to our driver board. So you have six wires uh, coming from the motor in this case, or, or even more if your SRM has more than three phases. So that is, you know, I don't want to go too much into comparing SRMs to permanent magnet motors in today's video. Um, because that's not what it's about here. Uh, but you know, there are some differences there. And I saw this on my last video in the comments. There were some of you who were like, well, so it's almost the same as a BLDC motor with permanent magnets, or, oh, you can just drive it with a normal uh, electronic speed control. And I can see where that comes from, because if you look at the motor, it looks extremely similar. Um, but the fact that it has no magnets is not a minor detail. Like, it's not like, oh, it doesn't have magnets, so it's like slightly different from a BLDC motor, but it's almost... Well, okay, so I know it's technically still a BLDC motor because it's brushless and the power source of the controller is DC, so whatever. Uh, when I say BLDC motor for the rest of this video, I mean one with permanent magnets, okay? The point is, the absence of permanent magnets is not a minor change in the design. Like, it's not a small detail that just changes it a little bit. Like, that is a fundamental difference in how the motor operates. Uh, as I said, today's video is not going to be a comparison between permanent magnets or reluctance motors. Uh, but just know for the, for the rest of this video, uh, know that they are very different and they have very different requirements for driving them properly. 
Uh, so now let's get back to this board, right? Because we're not here yet. We need some additional things, because as we discussed all the way in the beginning of this video, you also need to switch those phases on and off at, at exactly the right moments, depending on where that rotor is. Uh, otherwise, it's going to go wrong. Uh, so how does this know where the rotor is? Well, if you look at the motor, I've mounted some hall sensors at the back of it, and hall sensors are effectively magnetic field sensors. Uh, and on the rotor, I stuck some little blue toy magnets, essentially. Uh, and so each time one of those magnets moves past one of those hall sensors, uh, the hall sensor produces an electrical pulse, uh, which is sent to uh, this part of the board right here. So here, this is where you plug those hall sensors in. Uh, and that is how this microcontroller right here, so this is an Arduino board, uh, knows the position of the rotor. Uh, so I've chosen this Arduino board because I'm familiar with it and it's easy to use, basically. I'm a bit of a lazy person. Uh, and so what this does is it receives that information. It receives these electrical pulses from the hall sensors. Uh, and based on which hall sensor is triggered, it knows which phase needs to be turned on. And then the Arduino will energize uh, the correct phase of our switching circuitry uh, right here. There is another thing that we need to do though. We also need to control the power level of the motor. Yep, you want to be able to control the throttle, right? You don't just want this thing to turn on and run at full power uh, all the time. You want to be able to control how fast it runs or how much torque it produces. Uh, you, want to, you want control over the power output of this motor. Uh, so how is that done? Well, like with many other types of motors, uh, we use something called PWM or pulse width modulation. So uh, the basic concept of pulse width modulation uh, is that instead of leaving the power supply on continuously, uh, you turn the power on and off very, very rapidly. And by varying the duty cycle, so essentially the width of these pulses, uh, you vary how much effective power the machine or the motor uh, receives. So if you make the pulses quite narrow, the motor is running at low power. Uh, and then as you make those pulses wider and wider and wider, the motor gets more and more power uh, until you reach full power, which is basically the power supply is now turned on uh, continuously. So that switching, that fast switching of the power supply, that is going to be done uh, on top of the switching that we're already doing. So we're already doing switching, right? Because we're switching on a, a specific phase, depending on where that rotor is. But on top of that, we're going to do more switching, faster switching, to control the power output of the motor. And this is going to be done on just one of these transistors. So in my case, uh, I do that on the bottom or the low side transistor. So if you look at one of these power strokes, instead of both transistors turning on, remaining on, and then turning off again, uh, the bottom one is actually going to turn on and off very, very quickly within that power stroke, and that's that PWM signal. Uh, that ends up controlling how much power the motor gets. Now actually it's not a very good idea to do that fast switching on the low side transistors and do the slow switching uh, on the top transistors. It's better to do it the other way around, so to do the fast switching on the high side and the slow switching on the low side. Um, I'm curious if any one of you in the comments uh, can guess why that is. 100 points for the person uh, who gets it right. Uh, but I'm kind of stuck with doing it this way because of how I designed the rest of the circuitry. So I have no choice now, but if I were to redesign this board, uh, that is something I would definitely change. Now, there's a lot of extra circuitry on this board that we didn't talk about yet. So there's all these little components, and effectively that is the, uh, the driving circuitry that connects our switching devices uh, to our microcontroller. So the microcontroller cannot just directly drive uh, those MOSFETs, there needs to be some circuitry in between to get it to work, uh, and that is what all of these components are. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail on all of that in today's video, because it's already going to be quite long and I don't want to make it that long, um, but if you, if you are interested in those details on how all of that works, and you want to know more about this board, maybe you even want to make it yourself, you know, replicate it, or, or make a better version of it, uh, that is entirely possible. So I'm going to take uh, the schematics, the PCB layout, uh, and also the software that runs on this little Arduino, uh, and I'm 
I'm going to put all of that on the internet so you can download it for yourself uh, and you can copy the whole thing if you want to uh, or you can make improvements and changes to the design. Uh, in fact, I would highly recommend you make improvements and changes to the design because a lot of the circuitry that I used is quite dodgy uh, and wacky in a lot of ways and I wouldn't do it the same if I designed it again. Again, one of the things I change is I do the fast switching on the high side transistors, but you know, that is just one of the things I change. There's far more to it than that. It's not a perfect circuit whatsoever. Uh, so yes, it, it technically works. It works really well. So you could just copy the design and, and run it. Uh, but I would highly recommend you make a bunch of changes should you decide to make your own version of this. That also goes for the, the software program that runs on this little Arduino here. Uh, that is a fairly basic program at the moment, so all it does is it turns on the right phase at the right moment according to the information from the Hall sensors and then the, the PWM duty cycle, so the, the width of those pulses that controls the power output of the motor, uh, that is simply proportional to a potentiometer that is right here. So if you turn this potentiometer, uh, that uh, changes the duty cycle. Uh, but what you could do if you want to be really fancy uh, is instead of just using that fixed duty cycle or you know, adjustable duty cycle, um, you could change the width of those pulses dynamically uh, within a single power stroke. Uh, and by doing so, you can change the, uh, the current profile that runs uh, through one of your phases during that power stroke. And that can allow you to do the kind of fancy torque ripple reduction strategies uh, that we briefly touched on in the previous episode. So that's all kinds of you know, much more advanced software that you could try to load onto this microcontroller. Uh, there are some optional uh, spots where you can put shunt resistors so that it can also measure the electric current. You make closed loop current control possible, that kind of thing. Uh, so there is loads of interesting options for elaborating the software, uh, which includes also regenerative braking, because right now it's just configured to use it as a motor, but of course the hardware supports regenerative braking as well, so you could just um, implement that into the software, change the timing when you energize those phases, uh, then you can actually use the motor for a regenerative braking as well. So I think that's all there is to say for me about this uh, controller board. Uh, now, I wanted to talk briefly about the motor itself as well, because I know some of you out there are interested in the performance of my uh, homemade electric motor. So how well does it actually run? Uh, uh, it does run fairly smoothly, although the uh, rotor isn't perfectly balanced and the shaft isn't perfectly straight. So at higher RPMs, it starts shaking a little bit. Uh, so I've got it up to about 2000 RPM, which is, I think it's quite good for a home built motor. Beyond that, it starts rattling and shaking a little bit too much and I don't completely trust uh, that it's going to stay together anymore. So you know, 2000 RPM, I'd say, is the uh, the maximum speed that I've reached on this thing. Uh, the torque output of the motor, I, I don't really know because I haven't got good equipment to measure the torque of an electric motor. Uh, but from just like trying to hold the shaft with my hands and running it, uh, I can tell that it does definitely produce quite a, a fair amount of it. Uh, and it should be enough to actually power something uh, at some point. So maybe we you know, one day we can actually use this motor uh, to power some kind of machine, which should be interesting. Um, as for efficiency, well, again, I can't really tell you that much about efficiency because in order to say something about efficiency, you need to know how much power it produces. But in order to calculate how much power it produces, you need to know how much torque it produces, which I can't measure. So again, no exact numbers on the efficiency. Uh, but I know that it does consume a fairly small amount of power from the power supply and it also runs quite cool. It doesn't get very hot. The electronics run quite cool as well. Uh, so actually the efficiency appears to be sort of better than I expected, uh, especially given that it's made of solid steel uh, rather than laminated, uh, like properly laminated steel, which is what real uh, factory built motors are made of so I think it's not too bad so if I look at the performance of this motor it's difficult to give you like hard numbers on this um, but from what I've seen so far I think it should be sufficient that we might actually be able to use this thing to power something at some point I'm saying at some point because I know some of you will expect me to make a video like in two weeks running the motor on a, on a machine it's not going to happen uh, so first of all, the next video is not going to be about this motor because I don't keep making videos about the same subject over and over again. But also, um, uh, yeah, that is going to take a little bit more time. 
uh, to find out what we can power with this and, and, and you know, maybe that thing has to be built still, who knows. Anyway, uh, I think that is all there is to say for me about this motor. It seems we've made yet another quite long video. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed watching it. If you did, then maybe consider clicking the subscribe button. Um, and I think all there is left for me to say is, is uh, thank you for watching.